I adopt the submission, save and extend the notes to, to with respect to two aspects. I don't think it is necessary for your lordship to completely jettison the group of companies doctrine, even though in my respectful submission, as a silo doctrine, it really doesn't add to anything very much. And two, doing away with the implied consent. Because in my respectful submission, and because I have got six heading, broad headings on the basis of which I'll make my submission today. The doctrine of implied consent does not do away with the formality of an arbitration agreement under Section 7. It doesn't and it can't. And the reason for that is that whenever you imply a term into a written agreement, it is deemed as if that clause or that term in fact forms part of a written document. Now, if you imply that a particular person who is a non-signatory is actually the real party, then in my respectful submission, in fact, squarely falls into section 7, and I'll make that good when I deal with section 7 submissions that I have. So let's so, go to your aid memo then. Yes. Because so I'm on my aid memo, paragraph 2. Because so your lordship may come straight away to paragraph 3. So what I'll tell your lordship is how I've structured the aid. I have an introduction of seven paragraphs where I set out the background that your lordship should bear in mind while considering this case. Then I have six different heads of submissions, and I'll, I'll, I'll run through them as fast as I can. Plus, paragraph three of my aid, look, there are, in my respectful submission, three fundamental facets which form the backdrop of consideration. Look, the first fundamental facet, and I think this is absolutely well accepted under Indian law, as it is under other laws, is the doctrine of separability. And that is, in my respectful submission, fundamental to the consideration because it is the doctrine of separability which looks at the validity and enforceability of an arbitration agreement. And why that becomes important is that there are lots of passages, and I think a lot of chloro and other decisions, which talk about the performance of a contract and obligations that a party may have undertaken under it. But today, what your lordships is looking at is in relation to a non-signatory and performance under a separate doctrine, which is a separate arbitration agreement, there may be rights that you may exercise where you commence an arbitration agreement. If somebody initiates an arbitration against you and says, sorry, you are bound by an arbitration agreement, you are obliged to arbitrate our dispute, you can't go and file proceedings in court or do something else. But that is fundamental in my respectful submission and your lordship system is this yes, because performance has to be judged from the performance of rights and obligations under an arbitration. There's the second aspect which is extremely relevant to your lordship's consideration is India's acceptance of the localized theory of arbitration. Some of your lordship's in Bhatia International, we diluted that principle. We went a little step ahead and we said it doesn't matter that the seat of arbitration is something global. Paragraph 88 of Balco, where well, it's the first U-turn came to become an open for That is registered. Very far of And when he was looking at section 2, the fourth does not lack the territorial principle adopted by the application at 1996. It certainly does not introduce the concept of delocalized arbitrations into the application at now, the reason why that is critical, Malone, is this. France, as your lordships is aware, does not follow the localized approach, and Tao originates from France. France follows the transnational. On the other hand, 
So that's one further reason why you're not sure the the Singapore test. It's because Singapore and England follow the localized. Singapore is a model law country, because I have, in fact, in my footnote, and the decision is there before my thoughts, uh, there's a decision called PG First Maintenance, the 2013 decision of Malut's Justice Sundaresh Menon, when he just, in fact, recently been elevated to become Chief Justice. And in that case, he has very categorically set out that Singapore follows the localized regime. The reason why that is different is because there is a national law which governs the conduct of arbitrations, unlike France, where it doesn't matter. And words, for the French aspect in particular, this was, can I just draw your lordship's attention? Your lordship needn't open this right now because it's all there. You can so just mark this. page 1171 of my, my edition. Which has the article from Bernard. Why don't we read your note? Then we can maybe go through some of your documents and uh, the judge. I'd better go to do that. How, just, how long is your note? Well, it's a 15 page note. Let's run through the notes so that we get the whole bearing. Get a picture your, of this. And then we can go through, you know, I'll, we can touch upon the judgment, etc. Because I'll absolutely do that. The reason why I made that, why I was just making a reference to Hanisha, because Hanisha draws that comparison at page 117. So let's go to para uh, 5 now. Yes, so can I just make two or three points just before I get to clarify? So I'll, I'll just run through the I'm not the third doctrine is we've accepted that contracts you know, are certain and terms must be read as such. Now, you know, why the average public policy? Because your Lord you know, is considering a doctrinal approach and there's you know, no difficulty with that. One, you know, we want to be considered as a hub for arbitration. Two, you know, and this is slightly critical, awards which are made in India need to be enforced outside of India. So, Malut, your lordships wouldn't want to be in a position, and I've made that good Malut in paragraph. Well, let's just read on, read on. Let's just, just, just uh, read the note, actually. I'll just so, this backdrop, paragraph, becomes essential. When considering India's Arawan legislative policy, to one, be considered as a hub for arbitration, two, to ensure that awards which are made in India would be enforceable outside of India in terms of the New York Convention, to be Articles 2, 1 and 2, 2, and enforce awards in India, which are consistent with the New York Convention, which your lordships will have to bear in mind, Section 44 of the Arbitration Act. Because this decision will go across all, all these three paragraphs. These principles must drive, in my respectful submission, the interpretation of Section 7 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, insofar as ascertaining whether an arbitration agreement can be extended to non signatories, as well as appreciating the doctrine of claiming through and under as set out under Section 8 and 45. Looks, I'm sorry, I'll just take a 20 second digression. Imagine a scenario where looks, a suit is filed in India. And the court under section 45 refers the matter to arbitration, which is say in London or Singapore. And they turn around and say, sorry, under our law, we cannot start arbitration against a non signatory. Because jurisdiction also will be the law of the seat. So, therefore, if an application is which, in which I've dealt with later, it is, it's in fact, in my respect, it's a defendant's law. If such an application gets filed, how, will, how does the court proceed? Does it just send everything to arbitration? Person goes to Singapore, then comes all the way back and says, sorry, I can't do anything. So it's anyway gone. Arbitration is gone. Time is spent. Now let's paragraph six. Bearing that, it is respectfully submitted that as a seat, India cannot be overzealous to extend the jurisdiction of arbitral tribunals to non-signatories who may simply be a part of a group of companies. Two, Courts applying Indian law also ought not refer parties to arbitration, whether domestic or international, on an expanded interpretation of claiming through an under. And tribunals also ought not put themselves in a position where, as it transpired in Dalar real estate, an award is passed in, in the seat court and is held not to be enforceable by an enforcement court because different principles will also be adopted. And why this is again extremely important is what I've said at a paragraph seven, because your lordships is dealing with the question of jurisdiction. It is imperative to bear this in mind that since this issue touches upon the jurisdiction of arbitral tribunals, any interpretation by this honorable court 
ought to be consistent with internationally accepted principles for joining it as non-signatory to an arbitration. That is because the issue of jurisdiction is considered de novo by a court, whether it be the setting aside or the enforcement. This has been set up by the Singapore Court of Appeal and PT First Media, where the court stated that jurisprudence of the Singapore Court has also evinced the exercise of uh, de novo judicial review. The Singapore International Commercial Court, this is in fact Sir Bernard Eder in CPU, where he stated a challenge to the tribunal's jurisdiction should be heard by way of a de novo hearing, as well as Dalamut, where at the enforcement stage, what follows the court said is our view. Uh, that an arbitral tribunal's own view on its jurisdiction has no legal or evidential basis, and a party who has not submitted to the arbitrator's jurisdiction is entitled to a full judicial review on evidence of an issue of jurisdiction before, an, uh, before the English court. So, my suggestion, Lord, and I, as, I, as I'll make that good, is going to be this. If we overexpand this doctrine, even if, I'm, even if I have an Indian seated international commercial arbitration, and the arbitral tribunal proceeds against a non signatory. When I go out to enforce that award and there's a de novo review of jurisdiction by countries which follow the localized regime, maybe not in France, but there's a significant number of countries under the New York Convention follow the localized regime, the UNCIP trial. That award is susceptible to not to be enforced on the ground that there is lack of jurisdiction. So, whatever interpretation that your lordship sets out, Transcends three spheres. The sphere of the tribunal's jurisdiction, the sphere of enforcing awards outside of India, and take the case, say, of an Indian company, an Indian parent, a big trading house, say, taking sugar mills from UP, exporting it outside. It takes the call, it says, I'm setting up a subsidiary in Singapore, I'm setting up a subsidiary in the BVI, I'm setting up a subsidiary in Cayman Islands, it's fully entitled to do that. That BVI company and the Cayman Island company enters into a contract with a Chinese company or Hong Kong company or whatever. There is a dispute. That arbitration award is passed against the BVI company or the Singapore company. Let's assume the Singapore company is a $2 company, but the Chinese or the Hong Kong company perfectly with its eyes wide open says, I will enter into a contract with a $2 company and I will, at the end of the day, have my dispute with the $2 company. Dispute is hot, dispute is lost. Can you enforce it against the Indian company in India? In my respectful submission, the answer is no, you can't. Because with open eyes, you contracted, you the foreign company contracted with my foreign subsidiary. Why you fight it there? That's why section 44 will become critical. New York Convention Articles 2, 1 and 2 will become critical because this interpretation that your law should give, they will run across all these three tribunals, jurisdiction 2, 1 and 2, 2 and 44 of the arbitration. Mr. Diwan, no, no, no. you are talking about enforceability. That's the emphasis now. It's all three. Yeah, it's equal equal. Also, but yes. you see, just by applying the doctrine, we are not saying a non-signatory is being brought in. We have to also look at his intent, his conduct. Those are the parameters on the basis of which uh, we'll apply the doctrine. I mean, just because the doctrine is, uh, we adopt that this is a doctrine to be followed. It doesn't mean that we bring in non-signatory without looking into their intent and conduct. Theologist is absolutely right. And which is why it's one of my submissions where I point out to certain paragraphs from Chloro and Cheren and MTNL, which I'll tell you Lord, from practical experience, because we use all these judgments very often in international commercial arbitration to so either bring in a non-signatory or to try and move away from an arbitration, are used in a manner which in my risk, in my view, overexpand the jurisdiction of the tribunal. And since your lordships is sitting in five today, in fact, one of my submissions is going to be that your lordship should either clarify those parts or set aside or strike out certain parts of those decisions. So that it cannot just be a group of companies or single economic entity and nothing. It cannot it can be nothing. That's right. But there are parts of all of these judgments which are cited often and often enough, which become a that, I mean, uh, that's what lawyers, uh, ingenuity is something which you cannot ever, uh, which you cannot ever curb. Since your lordship is giving clarity today, and I, I made that good and I'll take your lordship. That's only a great aspiration that, you know, judges can give clarity which will last for all times to come. But, but certainly, it's as good as the next lawyer with an imaginative mind. Yes. But, but certainly your lordship in my respectful submission sitting here should look at this aspect, which I think is important. 
because it has significant ramifications. And that, that's really the point I wish. You seem to be suggesting that uh, the omnibus expression of group of companies is uh, not very precise. So go into expressions such as consent and other things is what you are. Mutual intent. Mutual intent. Mutual intent. Don't go by just the economic entity being entity the same. Just like so. that, which have generally been. In fact, it was the best I have suggested that your workshop floats. So concrete, yeah. concrete suggestions as you suggest, Mr. Yes, yeah. yeah. in fact, I'll set out a paragraph 27 and I'll come, come, come there. Come on, let me just quickly run through paragraph yes. 8. The very yes. foundation of arbitration is all consent. consent. Because in fact, we had this book, uh, which there's an entire Oxford University Press book on consent and international arbitration. We put this uh, version of it here. I, it's not, I don't have it here. It says the principal characteristics of arbitration is that it's chosen by the parties by concluding an agreement to arbitrate. The arbitration agreement is considered the foundation stone of international commercial arbitration as it records the mutual consent of parties to submit to arbitration, mutual consent which is indispensable to any process of dispute resolution outside the international courts. Such processes depend for their very existence upon the agreement of the parties. Hence, this element of mutual consent is essential as without it, there can be no valid arbitration. Under Indian law, such consent is typically required to be expressed set out in writing by means of an arbitration agreement, and that's a standard signatory doctrine. Now, the, my first bullet submission is this. The group of companies doctrine and the single economic entity doctrine have no legal form and cannot be the basis for imputing consent. It is respectfully submitted that the GOC doctrine has no legal form. As set out in paragraph 8, well, these are my first skeleton submission. The GOC doctrine is a purely economic concept, which has no basis in either contract or company law. It runs counter to the principle of separate legal personality or companies. And this decision that I have cited, which is the Bank of Tokyo, in fact, is Lord Goff's decision, where it's Lord Hoffman, then a lawyer, was arguing. And interestingly, your lordship will find the same quote, uh, even in Mr. Kambata's mission, we just happened to have extracted it. Uh, at the same time, where because he says, Mr. Hoffman suggested equivalently that it would be technical for us to distinguish between parent and subsidiary companies in this context. Economically, he said, they were one. But we are concerned not with economics, but with law. The distinction between the two is in law, fundamental, and cannot be breached. And also that same book that we have, which is Consent in International Arbitration, look what they have set out is this. The group of companies doctrine is probably the most prominent and controversial of the theories developed to extend an arbitration clause to non-signatory any parties. Unlike other bases for binding non-signatory parties to an arbitration agreement, such as agency, alter ego, estoppel, which have their origin in contract law or company law, the group of companies doctrine was developed specifically in the arbitration concept. The treaty is also carefully analyzed by various countries and compares the acceptance or lack thereof of the GOC doctrine. My Lord says, Narasimha, in fact, put that question yesterday. Is there a comparison? Lord, in this treaty, there is a comparison. Lord, it is part of the uh, bundle of authorities that I have cited. Your Lord's notes can look at it. It deals with France, Switzerland, England, and the United States. And Lord talks about how and when it gets accepted. Now, the rejection of the doctrine as a basis to extend the jurisdiction of an arbitrary tribunal over a non signatory in Peterson Farm was also relied upon by the Singapore High Court and Manager Steele at paragraph 75. Now, those paragraphs 12, 13, and 14, I have extracted from the Singapore High Court's decision in Manager Steele. But can I just take your logic through that decision? You go through this and then you go through the decision. Certainly. Yes. So, the rejection of the GOC doctrine as a basis to extend the jurisdiction of an arbitral tribunal over a non signatory in Peterson Farms was also relied upon by the Singapore High Court in Manager Steel, which at paragraph 75 observed that. For now, the import of Peterson Farms was that as a matter of arbitration principle, a tribunal has no jurisdiction to bind strangers to the arbitration agreement on the basis that these strangers are part of a large group under the group of companies doctrine. This was yet another example of how stringently the courts regarded consent to arbitration. Similarly, even the single economic entity doctrine has no legal form. In Manager Steel, the Singapore High Court rejected the argument that a single economic entity concept is recognized either under common law or under Singapore law. In, it, in fact, observed paragraph 92 that 
Because the law allows and treats a company as a separate entity from its shareholders in the ordinary circumstances, it is perfectly acceptable in many jurisdictions, including Singapore, for an enterprise to be established and carry on business as a BVI company with the attendant advantages of non-transparency of ownership, management, and financial positions. Generally, a BVI company need not make public details of its shareholders, directors, or financial statements. That the shareholders of a BVI company are unknown or may not be identified through public means is not relevant as to whether a BVI company has capacity to enter into legal relations. Its capacity is derived not from its shareholders' legal personality, but from its uh, separate and distinct corporate legal personality. Why any business person would choose to contract with or accept the credit risk of a BVI company without extracting a personal guarantee or some security is, of course, a separate matter. It has also been said under paragraph 96 that plainly the law is choose disregard of the separate corporate legal personality of a company except in exceptional circumstances and only where there has been some form of abuse. Respect for separate corporate legal personality of a company with the rights and liabilities attached to that personality is sacrosanct in nearly every other circumstance. So, in a lot of lifts the corporate veil, etc., etc., those are different circumstances. Otherwise, Separate legal personality rules is accepted. And if you've chosen to transact with the BVI company, then you've chosen to transact with the BVI company. And if you arbitration clauses with the BVI company or a Cayman Island company, then that's what you as a counterparty have chosen. Nobody's stopping you from going to court, which is the section 28 argument for which Mr. Kambata had raised. And we fully subscribe to that. But if your arbitration agreement is with the BVI company, and that's a separate legal personality. Then that's where it stands, unless, of course, most of the other grounds are made up to bring a non signatory in. Since neither the GOC doctrine nor the single economic entity doctrine can be recognized as ones having any legal form, They cannot be demonstrative of establishing any intent of a non signatory to outcome. So that's my broad basis. Now, as I come to the facets where I think where Chloro, Cheran, MTNL, and ONG, and my respective submission should be clarified or my, my set. Let's just first look at paragraph 103, Chloro, which sets out two basic. I would say the conclusion and the basis by which you can bring a non signatory. One, zero, three. Various legal bases may be applied to bind non signatory to an arbitration. 103.1. The first theory is that of implied consent, the party beneficiaries, guarantors, and other parties. This theory relies on the discernible intention and to a large extent on good faith principles. They apply to private as well as public entities. The second theory includes the legal doctrine of mutual relations, apparent authority, piercing of the way, joint venture relations, succession, and a stop. They do not rely on the party's intention, but rather on the force of applicable law. While there is no concern with respect to 103.2 of the law, where a legal basis is adopted to a certain which is the real party to the dispute, to the extent that paragraph 103.1 seeks to bind a non signatory to an arbitration agreement and to a large extent based on good faith principles, it should be clarified that unless a court or a tribunal finds there to exist a discernible intention to arbitrate, a non signatory should not be compelled to arbitrate. So, well, the law just strikes that red part out, and it is that you must find a discernible intent. It's, you don't sort of read a passage in a judgment and then you know identify you know some uh, like portion. You read the whole passage together. I said you know just the problem. Therefore, once we accept that mutual intent or consent are the key factors, how does consent or mutual intent get deduced? That's the point. That's and then to decide whether there was consent or whether there was a mutual intent. Obviously, you'll have to look at various various factors. How do you? 
And those factors cannot be designed, decided with any uh, specificity in advance. And I'm not for a moment suggesting that. Please, please don't take it. So therefore, you also accept that, well, mutual intent to arbitrate, consent to arbitrate. These are key because of party autonomy, because of the doctrine of severability, so on and so forth. Once we accept that, then in an isolated observation and chloro control, you're right, it may require a little bit of tightening up. But we can't just say, okay, you they read these observations in red and therefore don't read the observations in black, which are not highlighted. They, everything reads together, ultimately. I'll tell you, Lushus, for the difficulty. When I have no difficulty with the, with the broad aspect of your Lushus, Toro needs tightening up. And There's no difficulty it. once these observations are in the hands of seasoned arbitrators. They know where to apply the law. They know what yes. to They don't read the judgment as, I a, have, I have, as a sort of, a, you know, something written stone. So I have more examples, five examples, and these are, in fact, Mr. Kambata and I, I in many cases, been on the same side and been on the opposite side. And I've been on the sides where I have propagated a slightly overbroad approach. And these are real life examples of international. So that's the fun of lawyering, right? That's right. But the fun of certainty. You can never have certainty. It's the, it's a, the, the quest for the certainty. The fun of is, having certainty. Yeah. What I am uh, requesting my Lord to take this matter right. is bringing up... Mr. Diva, uh, this point is very well taken, that consent is an essential part of it, but have you suggested that uh, how to tighten it up, what are the factors which the court must take into account to decipher what whether there is actual consent or not? Yes. I will deal with that. That's a paragraph 27. It's a short, it's, there, there is in fact a merited decision and Lord, I would yeah, tell us uh, also come to dialogue with Lord, Can I just point out a few other paragraphs here which are really turning out to be the problem. Look, your Lord just will look at reconciling paragraph 71 to 73 and saying, of Chloro and saying, let's read it all together. But Lord, I can tell your Lord just often enough that 73 is read as a silent paragraph. And in my respectful submission, the way it also was founded in Cherim, seemed to suggest that what was accepted was a 73 or a silent. And 73, in my respect, is the problem because what 73 says is as follows. A non security or third party could be subject to arbitration without their prior consent, but this would only be an exceptional case. The court will examine these exceptions from the touchstone of direct relationship to the party signatory to the arbitration agreement, direct commonality of subject matter and the agreement between the parties being a composite transaction. So three facets which can be used to say, well, without consent, we can bring you in. The transaction should be of a composite nature where performance of the mother agreement may not be feasible without aid, execution and performance of the supplementary or ancillary agreement for achieving the common object, object and collectively have, bear, having bearing on the dispute. Besides all this, the court could, would have to examine whether a composite reference of such parties would serve the ends of justice. Now, look, please see how under these three facets it becomes so overboard. One, the first three, which is relationship, commonality of subject matter, and composite transaction have nothing to do with intention, standing by themselves. Two, performance. And there, paragraph 76 becomes a bigger problem. And three, does it serve the ends of justice? You may well you know, take that view when your Lord is sending a party, when your know, Lord is sitting in court. But when it's an arbitration agreement and someone hasn't signed it, and you haven't chosen an institution which allows for consolidation or joinder, when you're sitting ad hoc, can you just bring in a party? Because if I say take the ICC rules or if I take the CIAC rules or if I take the MCI rules or the DIAC rules in Delhi, and I can choose any of these. There's a provision for consolidation, there's a provision for joinder, which means I have consented to consolidation, I have consented to joinder. And in those circumstances, yes, multi-party disputes may well be joined together, but there is consent by accepting a set of rules, but not in an ad hoc situation. And that's really where it looks 73 then becomes tricky, because it leads to greater uncertainty. And Malus 76, and the reason why I say it becomes a bigger problem is that when it talks about the mother agreement and subsequent agreement, it has a fundamental bearing on Malus interpretation of contracts and the point of time you decipher intention. Let me just read out 76 more and then highlight the two problems. 
Paragraph 76, chloro reads as follows. The court will have to examine such trees with greater caution and by definite reference to the language of the contract and intention of the parties. In the case of composite transactions and multiple agreements, it may again be possible to invoke such principles and accepting the pleas of non signatory parties for reference to arbitration. Sorry, from the second sentence, it should have been in red. Where the agreements are consequential and in the nature of a follow up to the principle of other agreement, the latter containing the arbitration agreement and such agreements being so intrinsically intermingled or interdependent that it would be their composite performance which shall discharge the parties of their respective mutual obligation and performance. This would be sufficient, a sufficient indicator of intent of the parties to refer signatories as well as non-signatory parties to arbitration. The principle of composite performance would have to be gathered from the con from conjoint reading of the principle and supplementary agreements on the one hand and the explicit intention of the parties and attendant circumstances on the other. Both paragraphs 73 and 76 are inconsistent with the two fundamental concepts. 73 permits a non-signatory to be roped into an arbitration agreement merely on the basis that there is direct commonality of subject matter and the agreement between the parties constitutes a composite transaction that is insufficient to justify consent. 76 is inconsistent with the basic principle that intention of the parties to an agreement must be determined not only from the text of the agreement but also from the date of its execution. If on the date of its execution there was no subsequent agreement, then it would not be at this such that an arbitration clause in a mother agreement would bind a, bind a subsequent agreement unless so expressly provided. That's when you know, your doctrines of incorporation, etc., etc., will come in. But if I have signed an agreement on the 1st of January 2023, and it's a long drawn contract, and then I sign another agreement on the 1st of January 2024, and that either has a separate dispute resolution clause or has nothing. From a contractual interpretation perspective, how can you say that your mother agreement, which is 1st of January 2023, envisaged that subsequent disputes in a subsequent agreement would be covered by that agreement? That could never have been the intention of the parties unless it was expressly provided for. Saying all uh, future contracts or all disputes arising out of future contracts will also be a part of it. It's a separate contract. And it happens. We, there, there have been many cases like this. And Cloro was a case like this because in Cloro, the finding is subsequent agreements. Disputes under subsequent agreements can come back to the mother agreement. And those physiologists recollect in Cloro had their own arbitration process. From a, how would that be the basis to decipher in him? Because when so, the mother is given the, We get that point, right. Mr. Zivan. You are that point is well taken. You don't need to labor on right. that. All those passages in Cloro and subsequent, the point is well taken. I'm so right. Just to your point. Now move further. I will tell us. Which is the method? What is the method? What is the process by which yes. we would arrive at the actual concept that you are propagating? Very good. Paragraph 31, 31, 31, 28, and 31. Very good. So let's, I, I will skip. Let's go to. Uh, I'll skip, let me skip a couple of paragraphs. So 21. We see. Now come to 28 is where you quote. 28, then you start actually. Yes. So 21, 23, 25, look, in my respectful submission, point two. Same thing. The same kind of problem. Same thing. Thank you. Just one. Greater concern which arises from the point. Thank you very much. Let's just have a look at uh, paragraph 25 of my submission. Where? Your Lord, that these where? paragraphs allow non signatory to be bound without consent would make them inconsistent with the fundamental facet of arbitration, can only be resorted to with the consent of the party. And it's that little part that I wanted to refer to from ONGC, which is problematic in my respectful submission, notes, is that paragraph 30 of ONGC, where it is said, it noted that written intention to arbitrate between parties can extend to bind non signatories with the aim to target the credit worthy member of the group of companies. This is what Red says, which you have quoted yourself. I have. Ah, then exactly. We are, we, and we have referred to Red Fund, we have quoted Red Fund there. That's why I'm not from ah. saying, I'm not from you. Where you have referred to Red Fund yourself. I certainly have. Red Fund expressly refers to uh, what the purpose of the doctrine. That's right. Now, a paragraph 27 of your Lordship is absolutely right. I have referred to Red Fund and how Red Fund reads down now. That's right. And what Red Fund effectively was you know, a paragraph 27. I mean, what I've said out of paragraph 27 it says it's this. Now, Read Dao as being a group of companies doctrine. Read Dao in what it really should be. Dao for us is not the statute. Correct. 
not just a statute, but in other, sir, in other words, go by section seven. In fact, what the law is. And in fact, uh, at, at page 11, para 27, 2.54. I like According to the Dow chemical case, may perhaps be best characterized as authority that conduct can be an expression of consent. And that among all the factual elements, the existence of a group of companies will be relevant. I'm so deeply obliged. I'm so deeply obliged. That's what I highlighted to your Lordship's time consideration. Now, your Lordship has all of these judgments. Your Lordship has red fund, which I have quoted now as an instance of. But am I asking your Lordships to just simply subscribe to what is set out in red fund? And my respectful submission to is because there is a little balancing that's required. And that balancing is what I have set out at paragraph 28. <clears throat> and there, I will begin now go to para 31. Yes, can I That's where your, your two points yes. which you are making. How to really then infer uh, what kind of conduct and what kind of consent or implied yes. uh, term. So, one is that, and then towards the conclusion, Amlaz, I give you a lot of couple. Amlaz, can I read out 20? Because there's, a, there's something critical there. Because there's sure. a little balancing that's required. It is respectfully submitted that the evaluation that is to be conducted. There is a uh -huh. para 20. That, that, sorry, para 20. Is, is the evaluation to be conducted? The presumption must be balanced. No, so these are the presumptions which have been drawn by that phone with the equally compelling fact that the party who has negotiated a contract has deliberately chosen not to be bound by the arbitration agreement by having the contract executed through a subsidiary or a sister concern. The action of stepping away and limiting liability may well form the basis to demonstrate an intent not to be bound by the arbitration agreement, which at the point of execution of the contract has been accepted by the bank. And that's not my point. When your lordship has doctrines such as... So, but therefore, are you saying that basically no party which is not a signatory to a contract can be bound by the arbitration? No, there may be no circumstances where you may have accepted... Obviously. Where you may have written, but today, if there is no such, don't just look at your lordship to balance the evidence. If there is no evidence, suppose even I have negotiated the contract, but finally signed by my BVI subsidiary, the counterparty has been perfectly happy executing the contract with the BVI subsidiary. I have, using my group structure, shielded myself. Am I not entitled to do so as long as the counterparty? Why should that then? I'm the sugar of the store. Of course, it's a But it's a high seat trade happening with my BVI subsidiary. It happens all the time in India. So, precisely, Mr. Diwan, a party or a group company can arrange their affairs in a manner that I consent to move away from this particular part. This is what you are trying to say. That's correct. So, we are talking about determining the consent. Where we can easily see that there was to move away. Yes. So that is what we have to sort of focus on. In a, in a situation That's right. Well, look, there's a range in that way. I'm so deeply obliged. So what is by reading all of these decisions? I can tell you a lot of things with some amount, with, with some experience that I have in this. That these decisions are being read to say it's a composite transaction. You are performing the contract. That's only a subsidiary you are roped in. That's the concern. And nobody is looking into the fact that, yes, of course, I may have negotiated, but I stepped back and you perfectly well agreed to allow me to step back and step out of it. That's the para 34. Yes, para let, me, let me straight away know something. So now the test. So 34, 35, and 36. Yes, the down test you're looking for, yes. what you're suggesting. That's that's that. So look, the test that I am suggesting will look itself itself to the greatest one looks from a U.S. system which is set out in the consent to arbitration which effectively says there must be a clear and unmistakable intent to arbitrate. And also this must be from a dispute resolution perspective, from the doctrine of separability perspective. And what is also set out by Dalla, in the conquering opinion of Lord Collins, at paragraph 122, where it was right at the end of paragraph 30, what your Lordship should see the last four lines, it would have to be a conscious, deliberate act by the government. At anything less, deliberate act of the government make it less relevant because this is the government of Pakistan and the letter would not uh, be relevant. Yes, para 31, that's the, right. there's two tests. Uh, two tests. That's right. I set one. out in the additional skeletal submission the paragraph seven one, one there. I'll come to The conduct of the non-signatory party demonstrates to be bound by the arbitration as a separate uh, 
document and a separate contract, then my disputes will you, you will be arbitrated. And in cooperation of an implied term and contract where a non-signatory is implied to be a party to an arbitration agreement. These are the two bases which, if clarity is brought out here, will make it significantly easier. And these are exceptional circumstances. If there is something which will meet the Naga power penta test, and you can get me in, get me in. But if you can't, then you can't. So these and must be para 34, 35, 36 yes. is important actually. That's right. So look, how I have now distilled section of the Arbitration Act is as follows. I'll just read out the first part of section 7, which says arbitration agreement. In this part, arbitration agreement and agreement by the parties. To submit to arbitration for all of certain disputes which may which have arisen or between them in respect of a defined. Now, I divide that part of section seven into two parts. There are two parts of section seven of the Act. I'm reading paragraph 14. The first of which is the agreement by the parties to submit to arbitration certain disputes. So that's the first part. The second part of section 7 relates to the manner by which such disputes will arise under a that is under a defined legal relationship. No. In these proceedings, binding a non-secretary to an arbitration agreement ought to be considered for the first part of section 7, which is whether there is an agreement by the parties to submit to arbitration. It is only on the conclusion of such inquiry that the basis and substance of the dispute which may have to be arbitrated. Are required. So, <clears throat> so that's that's how I break section seven. And what I also must further submit is that it is uh, paragraph thirty-five is that the definition of party ought not hinder your motives because a party I will say must should be the real party because two one eight says unless the context requires otherwise. So your logic is not bound by Malus, just the definition as it stands. And therefore, in the paragraph 36, I say, if in a particular case it has to be asserted that the real party to the arbitration agreement is a non-signatory, then the definition of 21H ought not come in the way of restricting the arbitration only to the signatory. Now, just let's see your conclusion, Mr. Diwan. Yes, well, just a little point of claiming through and under. Through and under, it's okay, Mr. Yes. Uh, somebody I, that's right. I'm not going to repeat anything there. But please remember just one thing. When the section 8 and section 45 come into operation, <laughs> I have filed a suit in India. Very clear. It can only be related to an Indian suit or any other Indian proceeding. A non signatory comes claiming through an under. Say, why have you filed it against me? I am claiming through an under against this as a defendant. Send me to arbitration because there's an arbitration agreement with somebody who's a signatory. Certainly, the signatory comes no difficulty. It's a direct 845 reference. Claiming through and under is actually a defendant's doctrine. It's meant for a non-signatory to come in and accept that obligation to arbitrate. Because the other person who has filed the suit says, yes, I may have a contract with person X. Maybe you're the assignee, maybe you're not the assignee. I don't know. Maybe you're the parent company. I can't go against it. I file a suit. Parent company comes and says, no, I'm claiming through and under my subsidiary. I am the real party. Send me to arbitration because your contract has. So look, it's a defendant's doctrine. And what I am only saying is this: that defendant's doctrine under 8 and 45 cannot look, be used to just bring a non-signatory to the group of all right. Which is where there's been a conflation in my respectful submission. All right, let's go now to the conclusion. No, I'll certainly not come to the conclusion. Look, and the point looks we make looks is this. It is respectfully submitted that this honorable court. How to set aside parts of the decision in Provo and subsequent judgments that allow arbitral tribunals to commence arbitration only on the basis of the GOC doctrine. The GOC doctrine cannot, without more, extend an arbitration agreement to a non signatory. The determination of the real party to an arbitration agreement must be reflected on the execution of the arbitration agreement. This approach to balance the public policy between certainty of contracts. As well as resolution of disputes, and will not be antithetical to the development of arbitrary jurisprudence. That is because there are other recognized doctrines on the basis of which multi party disputes can be resolved under the broad umbrella of a single determination. These include concepts such as recognition of a single arbitration to the doctrine of incorporation by reference, or in the case of institutional rules, providing for consolidation. 
of disputes. As Hannah Schur notes, joinder and consolidation of disputes is an issue distinct from the issue of extension of an arbitration clause to a non-signatory, and therefore the policy considerations for the two mullahs should not be considered. Yes. And that is because, unfortunately, what has happened look, with Croro and the judgments which have gone down. But I want to answer one question which my Lord Justice Roy had raised, and not today, but a couple of days ago, from a construction contract perspective. Employer, contractor, subcontractor. Mr. Mr. Kambata Mullahs had made certain submissions, in which I adopt. Under the FIDIC rules of contract, which again internationally for contract becomes very, very relevant. Really? And I've quoted this. Article 4.3 says that the subcontractor has no privity with the employer. Now, if your lordship's laws under Indian law says, sorry, in such a situation, because of composite transaction, because at the end of the day, you subcontractor are only performing for a contractor who's performing for an employer, I can hook you in. Then it's going to be against the FIDIC rules for construction of contracts. So the construction industry, well, in my respectful submission, goes gets into a bit of a dizzy. Well, let's take international trade. The way companies are set up for international trade and commerce again well, provides proof structures. And therefore, well, I would be very hesitant in accepting, as the other side says, chloro in its entirety. And the judge. All right. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Divan. I think we. Uh, so thank you very much, Mr. Divan. But I'm, I'm so deeply obliged. Well, it's all my references. I'll just take. One. I'm not going to make a take. Take a My first skeletons and my additional skeletons, and these must have make a reference to everything that is relevant. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Divan. Because I'm so deep. Anybody else? I have just five minutes. I have here for. Ah, uh, uh, yes. But do I have five details? Where are you all? Two. How will you be able to argue? We don't have any idea of what has happened before you. No idea. Come on. What is the proceeding? They wouldn't have missed you. You are watching on the virtual mode or physical mode? But physically, I as well as virtually, whenever I could not be here. What is what is the point you want to make? What is the word so far? But I have just made three charts. If not, can permit me, Malak. Charts, all right. Give us the charts. Please. But I just wanted to allow just put some. But I just wanted to just, just place before Lordship just the elephant on the table. And this, unfortunately, I didn't have solutions, but I was raised certain important issues, my Lord, the Lordship yes. to consider. But one is, my Lord, which fell from my Lord, uh, my Lord Justice Nasima on the, on the very first date of the hearing, and which my Lord, my Lord the Chief Justice, my Lord, picked up on the issue of uh, my Lord, parole evidence. That, my Lord, common law jurisdiction, my Lord, we go by, there is an aversion to parole evidence, and we go by what is the, uh, the written document. And therefore, my lord, we come to section 7 of the law. Now, what the difficulty comes, my lord, when we come to my lord, 8, 11, and 9. Because the difficulty will be, my lord, that when there is certainty in section 7, that we know those A, B, C, D, E, and they are all written. It may not be a written signed document, but there are exchange of part between parties, written evidence. My lord, the section 9 judge, section 8 judge, and section 11 judge has clear, my lord, Evidence before it, primary evidence before it. Now, Malad, what happens, Malad, when you don't have that and you have to go beyond the written the world? Malad, that is why the difficulty will happen, Malad, if this group of companies doctrine traverses beyond Malad, Section 7. Malad, but for example, in our case, my lord, it took three years and we suffered an interim order. So much so, my lord, there was a restraint on, on alienating assets. So, what would you like to, how do you formulate your uh, submission? Now? Yes, my lord. My, lord, my, my first your point, so that you can just take them down. And... Yes, my lord. my lord. My first proposition, my lord, with Lordship will see from the chart which I've given the first chart. My lord, what the group of companies doctrine does 
is it conflates my lord two contrary concepts if lordship sees the chart my lord i have given at the first paragraph my lord is called the which, which requires presence of wrongdoing and the second column is absence of wrongdoing now my lord professor gary bond calls the first one non consensual meaning my lord that there is what requirement to formulate, formulate. you formulate it may i formulate that first yes. proposition first you are saying my first proposition is the group of companies doctrine conflates contradictory propositions of law and hence is unworkable <laughs> Which are those contradictory propositions? Please, my lord. My lord, the prop if lordship has my first chart, the concept of alter ego. The concept we are taking it down now. The concept of. Well, I can su submit formula. I can uh, my lord, give submissions later. Uh, form the concept of alter ego. Form can the con creation. concept of alter ego. The concept of alter ego, my lord, is based on wrongdoing. And there has to be egregious fraud or some kind of sham, evasion. Some kind of wrongdoing has to be there, my lord. And here, my lord, the intent is not so much as whether you are intending to be bound by the arbitration agreement. All right. So the, the in one is alter ego. Alter ego. Alter ego. Second, my lord, sham, evasion of statute, facade, and my lord, I've given the judgments where. My lords have in several cases explained this, including my lord, the recent case in Balwan uh, 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 case, lordships have, my lord, dealt with this issue. And lordships have explained, my lord, that it is not just having uh, a tight control company or closely held companies. There has to be some element of fraud. There has to be some intent to avoid obligation or to defeat a statute or, or avoid evade payment of tax. All right. And Professor Gary Bond says that this is non-consensual, meaning that even if you did not intend to be bound by an arbitration agreement, if your intent was to avoid and evade, then you are still bound. And uh, and he, of course, applies the group of companies doctrine and says that in such circumstances also a non-signatory entity is bound by the arbitration process. All right. There's a first proposition. What's yes. Well, in contrast, my lord, the first in contrast, lordship sees. The other Malad, commonality of subject matter, existence of company, group of companies, composite nature of contract, performance of contract, single economic reality. But these what lordships have over time, my lord, etched out as attributes of group of companies doctrine, my lord, are all not based on wrongdoing. It's simple that, for example, my lord, in, in MTNL lordship said if there's a tight economic structure, even if there is no wrongdoing, even if there's no evasion. Even if, the, even if the intention is not to avoid a group of companies and you are bound. Now, my lord, the difficulty is, as I was saying, my lord, a section. So, what you are really saying is that the whole concept is intended to reach out cases of fraud, uh, positive wrongdoing. I am obliged. I am obliged. Uh, these aspects which have been highlighted in chloro. They really are not based on wrongdoing at all. You may have a composite contract, you may have performance by one Absolutely. of the obligations of an absolute without any interest. I'm obliged, yeah. I'm obliged. And if seven is absent, my lord, if the seven test is absent, you cannot bring in such. We part. got that, yes. That's all. Well, the, the second, my lord, related to this, my lord, and my lord, this is the issue. My lord, of course, my lord, I'm trying to pitch it at a level, my lord, I don't know whether my lord Nordstrom will accept this. But what I'm submitting is that even with regard to and my lord, this is where lordship will have to reconcile because I've given the contradictory judgments of all the high courts, my lord. Even when it comes to egregious fraud or alter ego piercing, my lord, Honorable High Court of Delhi and Honorable High Court of Bombay and Honorable High Court of Madras have taken contradictory views. Coordinate judges have taken contradictory views and I've given the, my lord, the table in the third table. I will not read it, my lord. But that an arbitral tribunal being a creature of a contract or a, 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 with a specific remit will not have the plenary powers of the court. Well, these judgments are post competence, competence, post my lord, my lord's Toro control. The learned judges are aware of all this, yet they hold my lord that a court, an arbitral tribunal being of limited jurisdiction, cannot pierce the corporate veil, and that can only be done 
by a court of tenure jurisdiction. My Lord, just to name a few judgments, my Lord, in the, in the Delhi High Court, my Lord, I've given in the third chart, Sudhir Gopi versus Ignu. My Lord, Justice Bakru's judgment is there. And my Lord, Bombay High Court Justice Gupta's judgment of NOD Bearings Private Limited, I've given as serial number three, my Lord, of, of the third from, uh, uh, part, my Lord. I've just extracted judgments. I didn't want to waste Lordship's time by going through my submissions, but I've extracted those parts where these. Uh, uh, the discussion is there, and the courts, courts, the High Court says that it cannot go, the tribunal cannot pierce the veil. So, my laws will have to reconcile this, and my Lord, of course, Lordships will hold one way or the other that whether this, this group, I mean, I've given also my Lord, the other judgments which have held, they can do it. So, my Lord, Lords, my laws will have to my Lord, reconcile this issue. And, my Lord, the last thing I would submit, my Lord, and which I was submitting on Vidya Dhoni, and I'm done, my Lord. In Vidya Dolia, my Lord, Lordships have, my Lord, uh, made the, uh, it's not an it, it, exhaustive list, but Lordships have given certain exceptions to arbitration. Now, my Lord, two exceptions, if I may, my Lord, place for Lordships consideration. My Lord, one is when there's an adjudication at REM, or it has an effect at REM. And the other is when there is a statutory machinery provided for the adjudication. And Lordships have, in both these circumstances, it is out. The arbitral tribunal cannot enter into this domain. And my Lord, I have given in that second chart, my Lord, First instance, the, yeah, the, in the case of INREM would be a probate. I'm obliged. And the second would be surface, where there's a... Example. Deeply obliged. Or in my case, my Lord, I would submit if Lordship considers the Companies Act. Because my Lord, in the Companies Act, and I've given the sections in the second chart, all the provisions are there for inquiry and investigation into the character of the company. Right. Now, would Lordships, my Lord, permit a tribunal, which is a creature of two parties agreeing to a, an arbitrator who may not be a trained lawyer? There is no my Lord, obligation. As Lordships said the other day, it could be a, a, a technician, it could be an engineer, an architect. Would Lordships say that the power which is vested in a tribunal by the statute of determining who is the controlling authority, well, would that my Lord, be given to, a, uh, uh, to a, an arbitral tribunal? Ultimately, my Lord, certainty, my Lord, which is, is the issue, my Lord, I, I'm obliged. Thank I'm so sorry, my Lord, I interrupted. No, no, thank, thank, thank you, Light of in. That is a, thank you, you, Mr. Goch. And I have just a yes. few minutes. I'm for respondent number one. And but one second, where is uh, George Putin gone? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Yes, yes. Are you wondering where you are suddenly disappeared? No. You have disappeared behind the scene, George. <laughs> my Lord, I appear for coming. Uh, for India and IA number 69863 of 2023. Could you appear for the National Coordination Committee? Of Having heard the arguments at length, now my lords have the benefit of hearing both sides, uh, the views of both sides on the issue of group of company doctrine and arbitration and the various views across the group. My lords, at the outset, I would just like to mention that ancestral does not per se have a group of company doctrine, but looks at non-signatories to arbitration, corporate structuring. This is what ancestral has looked at. The mandate of ancestral, that is the United Nations Commission on International uh, Trade Law, encompasses promoting ways and means of ensuring uniform interpretation and application of international conventions and uniform laws in the field of international trade law, collecting and disseminating information on national legislation and modern legal developments, including law in the field of international trade. You have a note? Give us a note. Really? Uh, I'll, I'll uh, give a note after this, my lord. I'll just uh, I'm just skipping most of it, which was already covered. I'll prepare a note with uh, comparison. So what is the, tell us, uh, just formulate what your point is, uh, George. Uh, my lord, I'll just uh, draw a comparison between the Indian uh, Arbitration Act and the ancestral model law, the 2006 amendments to the ancestral model law, the reason for the amendments, and I'll also touch upon the New York Convention because the model law complements the New York Convention. And last point would be on arbitration without privity. Uh, in this regard, it's important to know that the Arbitration Act of India is based on the model law, and there is reference to that in the preamble and in the statement of objects and reasons of the, the state. So the legislative intent is clear that the Indian model law. So where does Incitral stand? Incitral stand on the group of companies doctrine. Uh, my lord, the Incitral has brought about the 2006 amendments to 
accommodate non signatories to the uh, arbitration this i just where do we get He's standing on the wrong side sorry He's standing on the wrong side <laughs> well i mean it's non signatory is not a group companies dot in that so i said it's i mean neither here nor there but i'll just put it across what exactly it's I don't Stand. know how many countries have accepted the 2006 amendment. Yes, I, I'll, I'll, I'm coming to I'm coming to that. Like, Mr. Uh, George, why didn't you give us a note on this? Because yeah, I'll that. give a note on this. I'll just quickly go through the because that'll be better. You know, we'll have we'll be able to then see how the how it is has how it has evolved. Yes, yes. But perhaps you have prepared a note which also takes into account other this thing, but so you can just consolidate it and you know sort yeah, of I mean, reduce the note and then give it to us. Yeah, a lot of it was repetition of what that is what I was trying that. to avoid that. So in your note, uh, just delete the part which have been covered by the others. Yes, yes. And right focus now, on uh, and right now just sort of formulate your points and yes. you can give us a note. So just in two or three points that you want to make, you can tell us uh, to take it down. Yes. So is there a suggestion that you have or any idea that you would want us to know? Just you can uh, tell us that. Yes. Uh, it's page. Uh, if your lordships could have volume one of my companion, page 33. Just formulate it, John. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, read this out. It states the reasons why the amendment was made. Amendment was uh, Article 7 was amended in 2006 in order to respond to concerns voiced by an increasing number of scholars, practitioners, and judges who are of the view that formal requirements set out in the original version of Article 7 should be amended to better conform to international contract practices. It was pointed out by practitioners that in a number of situations, the drafting of written documents was impossible or impractical. In such cases where the intention of the parties to arbitrate was not in question, the validity of the arbitration agreement ought to be recognized. George, you put all this in the notes. Yes. Make it a short three or four page note and give it to us. Yes. We'll have a background of why uh, the 2006 Act uh, model law, why the model law was amended in 2006. Yes. How many countries have uh, accepted the uh, broadening of the definition yes. uh, in the arbitration agreement? And. Uh, uh, yes, can give it to it. If Let's it call upon the other side so that you can if give you can touch upon uh, two points and uh, just on the arbitration without privity because uh, I mean, Dala and those chemicals have been dealt at length. So I've not, uh, I'll not touch upon that once, uh, once again. But uh, on the on Article Seven, my lords, if I could just quickly uh, have which. The article uh, George, give us a note. Hmm? Sure. Just sure. give us a note. Sure. Very, very, very brief. I am for respondent number one and two in five one zero one. Ms. Arora, you're on the right side, right? George was on the wrong side. I hope you're on the right side. I am on the right side. I am right side in the sense that you are you are supporting the group of companies. I am completely Dr. supporting the arguments that have been advanced by the Learned Solicitor General and Dr. Singhvi. And I support the principle of group of companies to be read in. I only have a very, very brief, let me just make Tell us point, point very clear. My Lords, first of all, I have heard whatever I have staged now. All these matters, uh, Mr. Devan has appeared for Respondent 9 in 501.1. I believe Mr. Darai Skambata has appeared for Respondent number 8 and Mr. Ghosh for the petitioner. Now, what's significant in this matter is that this matter does not arise out of Section 11. It arises out of Section 9. And Section 9 is very distinct and different from Section 8 and Section 11 because Section 9 while the court may have applied the principle of group of companies to pass an order restraining the parties because of the very nature of the contract, but 
Section 9 principles are entirely different from that of 8 and 11. My Lords, by various orders, it has now been held that third parties can be joined in the matters of grant of interim relief, protection and preservation, before, during the arbitration and also after the award till such time as it is executed. So therefore, the arguments that have been advanced, and I believe it was suggested by my learned friend that the issues are different and should be detailed. I only want to put this on record, lest the final order deal with setting aside the interim protection granted by the High Court. My Lords, I have placed the judgments under section 9. So, which is your matter? This has to be dealt with. This is McLeod Russell versus KKR India, where everyone seems no. to have addressed an argument no. on 8 and 11. No. No. My lords, it is 501.1. S it's 501.1. It's 8607 of 2022. The most we hear, we would take it that arguments were addressed on the general. That's right. That's we are not going to be I am grateful. I need that clarity to before the regular. Sir, we are not going to. I needed that clarity to be in because I didn't want to be faced with an order suddenly setting aside no, no, an no, no. protection. We are not now be deciding my... individual cases. Let's yes. Sir, Rora, now my can make that point. Mr. Ambata, in fact, clarified that we were only arguing on law. I mean, all of us have been only arguing on law. None of us have really gone. I mean, your lordship hasn't. I haven't even touched the facts in McLeod. Now, my lords, coming down to very, very briefly, and I will just take about five, seven minutes of my lords' time and no more, because most of the judgments have been read, and I'm not going to read it, except to the extent it may be absolutely necessary. My lords, the entire principle of group of companies is based on an aspect of, as my learned friend argued, is protection, holding companies, subsidiaries, etc., which may be within the group. It is well recognized in the matter of corporate structuring that very often there are companies which have no or little assets and a holding company may be the one which will hold all the assets and they may be only leased to the subsidiary or it may be vice versa and that is to ring fence and protect yourself from the arm of the law in the event either the subsidiary or one of those group companies gets exposed to liabilities. That is a principle my lords will find in respect of structuring of the holding companies or the group companies very well settled because the idea is a protection. argument has been that look short of a case of egregious fraud. Yes. These are uh, structural arrangements which the law does recognize. Nice. I have no issue with that. They may be done for the purpose of tax return. They may be done for whatever reasons, ring fencing, protection. I am not on that aspect at all. But I only want to restate the principle when I show the judgments, whether it comes from chlorocontrol, Chevron, MTNL, and the last one in ONGC, that the court reaches out on what was your intent, was what, as it was argued just a few minutes earlier, was it your intent that I'm not going to allow an exposure of my assets into this contract? Or did you conduct yourself in a manner which was representative to the other party entering into the agreement that yes, the other companies within the group will stand for the liabilities, obligations under the contract? That will be the test. And in that context, if we start from chlorocontrol itself, if my lords, my lords, may I not take you to the judgments? If my lords have the written submissions filed by my colleague, I just want to show those few words. Yes. The 501.1. And therefore, if, if I have that context clear, each one of these judgments only signifies 
that what will be that nature of conduct, intent, reflected from the facts which will bring the group companies into the purview. Well, as we say a lot about non-signatories to be taken out. The principle is that each one of the judgments says non-signatory group companies. So the question of signatory does not arise because if they were signatories, they were automatically bound by the contract and the arbitration provision. Because they are non-signatory group companies, therefore the various principles have been set out in each one of the judgments, just few minutes, and I will satisfy that. My lords, my lords have my submissions. Would yes. my lords turn to page 17? First of all, chlorocontrol. I'm only going to read a few lines and a few words and phrases in them because my lords have already read these judgments extensio. I'm not going to take again that. My lords have page 17. Yes. This is a part of paragraph 72 at the bottom of the page. This evolves a principle that a non-signatory party. Now, my lords may mark the word. First of all, we are understanding that the party is a non-signatory. Could be subjected to arbitration provided. These transactions were with group of companies. And then, my lords, the principle is set out in chlorocontrol with great detail. Please remember the principles on the holding, subsidiaries, assets to be there or not available. Clear intention of the parties to bind the both. So therefore, first thing that the court will look at, was there an intention? What are the factual backgrounds to establish that intention? Both the signatory as well as non-signatory. In other words, intention of the parties is of significant feature. So the principle that the court said was intention. Now, my lords, please page 18. Three words in 103.1. The court sets out these principles. So these principles have actually been laid out. The first theory is that of implied consent. So the court will look into the facts to see whether there was an implied consent. Did you participate in the negotiations? Did you make representations at that time? That yes, this will be done through our subsidiary. Are there back-to-back -back contracts? where you took a subcontractor to execute your contract, but he's not a party to the main agreement, etc. So, my lords, we have to look at each one of them. Next, third-party beneficiaries. Simple classic example in 501.1. A loan of 100 crore each is advanced to two companies which have no assets. That loan, they are only the companies which take the money and pass it to the other group companies. So those two companies take 100 crore each from respondent number one and two, pass it on to their other three companies, uh, two companies. Now, there are orders which have been there, their representations made. Those companies will not pledge their shares. Those companies will not alter their status as being into public listed company. They shall maintain their MDTA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who has made the representation? The parties that hold 49% odd shares in those companies. But this is a conduct, this is a beneficiary, this is an implied consent, guarantors. Assignment and other transfer mechanisms of contractual rights. So this is the principle that Plural Control said, we will look at these, these factors to see whether these non-signatory third parties are assenting to be will be parties to the arbitration. Now, my lords, very quickly to Cheren, if my lords may come to page 19. Would my lords just come to the highlighted portion? In holding, my lords have that. In holding a non-signatory bound by an arbitration, the court approaches the matter
Uh, these are extracts from... Uh... Malos, yes, these are paragraphs. What I am only trying to establish before the court is that each one of these judgments set out a principle or a circumstance where it believed that in these particular fact and circumstance, a non-signatory group company would be amenable to be joined as a party to the arbitration, whether it was Cheren or for that matter, MTNL and subsequently ONGC. And in each one, my Lord, a principle or a test which is laid down. Like, may I just quick? It's there. It's there. We don't need it. We have looked at these judgments. It's there. Yes. And we'll also note here that this uh, particular matter, nine, NHS section 9, no question of detagging because they're not going to decide it on that's this. Right. That's all. Because in fact, that submission was made, and yes, that's right. none of us have touched the facts. Because in fact, we've been very conscious not to touch the facts. Yes, yes. We have your written. Other submissions are there. So, Manu, that then that is my principle in terms of understanding the principle of a right. holding subsidiary, right. management of ring fencing, protection. Then, what right. are those aspects that the court will look into? My laws will find it here. The only judgment that hasn't been set out here is right. that of ONGC. Yes, yes, and my laws. Uh, my lords, in ONGC, I would request my lords to look at paragraphs number. Just give me a moment, my lords. Page 283. Because principles in all these have been set up. ONGC. Yes. Para? My laws, paragraph 37 onwards until 41. Okay. Para 37. And those same principles have been then culled out as to where you would then have a non signatory third party joining in an arbitration. So, my laws, to say that section 7 requires it in writing, etc., the principle is entirely different. In what circumstances would you have the non signatory? But Thank you so much. Now, uh, and my last thing, only other thing is that this particular uh, reference will not apply in case of section 9 because I'm that not. You have already, that you have said. Not it's clarified. The principle is entirely different from 7, 8, and 11. Yes. yes. Thank you, Great. Ms. Dr. Singhvi, how long would you take? It's your Lord's Prayer, the special bench at 255. I have to finish before that. I'll finish. The Lordship has a. Not that this work will expand to fill the time available to do it. <laughs> I actually have more time. I need more time, but I'll finish before a lot is waste. Just broadly, what yeah. is your submission going and to be, Dr. It will be, it'll be faster. Yeah. If the quartmaster can put three notes, uh, three things. One is my note, which I gave you lot in the opening. Or should we call it note one? One is a rejoinder note I have given now, which is a pointed one. Argument this, answer this. Right. And third is CL1. That is case law one. There are also case law two and three. But these three will cover 95% of my note. So, it's simple that. Your Lordship has to really ask three or two or three basic questions. I'll take only a minute to One, well, as I say, the, the, the life of law is not logic but experience. So, well, if your Lordship were to go strictly by logic, your Lordship cannot have anybody not signing going to arbitration. That's the correct way to look at it. Now, obviously, that's not what your Lordship is going to do. With where is the intent? Second error, only wrongdoing will display my intent. My learned friend says, where is wrongdoing positive or negative, you will send it to arbitration. Can't you have an intent to go with your sister concerns, group companies to arbitration without wrongdoing? Third, well, if the shield is made to, as they use the word, ring fence, then well, if the logic applies any of those 10 tests and finds A, that there is fragmentation. Your lot finds that the entire intent to, dis 
Certainly, the dispute arbitration is frustrated by two companies being out because it is resistant. So, your lordship's doctrine is a superimposed doctrine which goes first to the true intent, but along with intent, sees all these other intents which I have already given. Let's go to your broad. Yeah. Yeah.